Hi, this is Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicles, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Stories of the Supernatural. Whether you're watching a video or listening to a podcast, please like and subscribe to us so that you can get notification of when a new show is released. Links to videos or MP3 files can be found on MiamiGhostChronicles.com. Go to MarlenePardo.com for information on new book releases. I narrate several podcast series that can be found on major podcast platforms and can also be listened to via Alexa, Sonus, and other home systems. Look for Supernatural Storytime for scary storytelling, Nightshade Diary for classic horror and adventure stories, Stories of the Supernatural for interviews with different guests on the show. If you want to get noteworthy news about the paranormal world, true crime conspiracy stories, and anything that is just plain weird, just visit Stranger Than Fiction Stories tab at MiamiGhostChronicles.com or find us on Blogspot. I want to thank you for being part of my audience, and I think you are all wonderful. Hi, everybody. It's Marlene with Stories of the Supernatural. How's everybody doing? Good, I hope. I'm doing good. People had asked me. I'm, I'm, I'm back to wearing for my, my, um, my cat headphone headset, you know, because sometimes some of the subjects that we talk about are so serious. It's like, let's not, let, I don't want to take myself that seriously about this. So let's just, let me put on this. Anyway, guys, um, number one, please don't forget to subscribe, like any of the channels that you find me on, whether they're, they're stories of the supernatural, Nightshade Diary, or Supernatural Storytime. I've got links to everything on MiamiGhostChronicles.com or MarlenePardo.com. Um, I am also have a new audio, well, it's a podcast, but I also put out a video version of Eerie.News, which is um, about every other day I release uh, stories that have come out, but just unusual, weird, paranormal, just, you know, true crime, you know, about half an hour more or less. So you can go to eerie.news and find out about that. Also, you can sign up for my newsletter, um, again, at marlenepardo.com. I send something out about once or twice a week. Sometimes it's articles, uh, just unusual things, of course. You know, you know what's that saying? Why be normal? Anyway, let's get on to the good part. And the good part is who I have as a guest. This gentleman's been here before a few years ago because time flies when you're having fun and his name is Kevin McQueen and he is an instructor in the Department of English at Eastern Kentucky University. He's written 12 books or more on biography, history, folklore, ghost lore, natural disasters, and historical true crime. Most of his books concern Kentucky but a couple are centered on Indiana and he did put out a book in 2011 titled The Axeman Came From Hell and Other Southern True Crimes that cover the entire region of the South. And I believe he's also has one that's covered into California, but we'll let him tell us about his books. Help me welcome him. How are you doing today, Kevin? I'm doing very well, thank you. Thank you for the very nice introduction. No, on the contrary, I, I, I have a feeling that you have more books than what I stated there, because like I said, you've been really busy since the last time we spoke. And uh, now you tell me you're working three at a time now, right oh, now. I'm, and... Yeah. Are you going to be going in the same I'm genre of true working crime? on three books? Actually, uh, the the biograph. Uh, some are uh, some true crime, some paranormal, some just weird historical okay. facts. Uh, the the mm -hmm. biography is actually somewhat out of date. Rather than 12 books by this point, it's something closer to 21 or 22. Okay, so you've almost doubled that over. Wow, yeah. Yes, and um, it's uh, because I know that you've based a lot of the earlier ones, especially on Kentucky, in that Midwest area. And isn't it surprising how much history you've discovered besides what you originally thought about as far as, are, are you originally from Kentucky? Yes, I am. Okay, did wasn't it surprising when you started doing research for some of these books, some of the stories that you came across that you're like, I'd never heard of this before. As oh, far very as- very much. Uh, uh, you just find the weirdest stuff right right because we hear you know for example uh, Lizzie and, uh Gordon. By this point, i'm talking about that genre 
of these uh uh Jack the Ripper, H. H. Holmes. And you think, well, okay, these were the 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 unusual, the the outliers in that society. But when you do your research, haven't you come across uh murderers or series of murders that were just as bad or even worse in some cases? Most of the research is done from old newspaper. I've had a habit for years of going uh, the Louisville Courier Journal, to be really specific. And I just take notes as I go, and you see these stories unfolding, just like stories from a novel. And uh, the things that sound really interesting, I write down the dates and the page numbers. So when it comes time to write a Midwestern book or a Southern book or a New England book, Kentucky, Indiana, what I'm choosing to write about, it's very simple to their finding stories that will fit the book. Okay. Yeah, you've already got your repertoire of stories. Um, and, you know, sometimes I've come across stories and we're, we're, we're talking here, maybe Civil War, post-Civil War, turn of the century, where people were very trusting. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. Of strangers, how's that? Like if somebody arrived and said, I my name is were. so and so. It's just amazing. The... That they were very. Um... Right, and everyone goes along with it. Yes, it, right. It, if somebody arrived and said, my name is so and so, and I'm the uh, whatever, I was like, people just like, okay. You know, they, they, they kind of, they, they, they were very trusting at the beginning of meeting somebody. And um, there was. They were, and I'm not really sure the reason for that. I'm sorry, what was that? Um, they were, and I'm not really sure why that is, why they were so trusting. But I've but heard you, people not really that long ago saying, uh, as recently as, say, 30, 40 years ago, people very seldom kept doors locked. Yeah. At least in rural areas. Mm hmm. Yes, I I recall my mom. I don't want to date myself here. She says in the 1960s, you know, I grew up in Miami. She says you would go to the beach and you could take off your jewelry and leave it like on your towel or on your, you know, wherever you were sitting. You know, if you were going to go swimming in the ocean, and you didn't think twice about that. So I kind of understand what you're saying as far as there was a lack of fear of that you were going to get robbed or anything of that nature. I don't um, think anybody me, would do that. Right. And um, let me ask you the, because I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with like, well, you know, they've made so many about, you know, H.H. H. Holmes and Lizzie Borden and Jack the Ripper and uh, things of this nature. Um <laughs> that you know they all made the headlines and um and even lizzie borden i heard that uh even when she had been um under suspicion i guess or going to trial she still had supporters from among her church group that she belonged to um because they couldn't they couldn't believe that she would uh, have committed that type of crime Yes, that's very true. She had uh, supporters. Uh, interestingly enough, once the trial was over and after she'd been acquitted, all of her friends dropped her. And she basically lived the life of a hermit right. for the rest of her life. So people were, were willing to go along with her up until the moment she uh, was found innocent in the eyes of the law. Exactly. And that was the end of it, I guess. I don't know. Maybe people talked twice about it once uh, years passed and obviously no other suspects were ever found so they started thinking perhaps um it might have been her after all well i, I also and i don't know if you th there was another thing also that unfortunately the flip side of that being accepting is from what i've seen uh people back then once stigma you know e even if you were how can i say not found guilty or there was suspicion against you or a story was told that stigma would attach itself to you and possibly your family, even if at the end there was no truth to it and it would follow you around for years. 
Um, and I, that, you know, that was the flip just, side. The flip the trusting nature is that once you expected of something, it stuck with you forever. Right. Right. Yeah, people would remember 30 years ago, you know, you were uh, suspected of whatever or you're somebody in your family. Because that was another thing. It was like that uh, your family suffered for your sins. You know, in other words, you everybody got, um, you know, tinged with, you know, you know, with whatever happened to any of their family members. And uh, I think also uh, um, a lot of times, I think that some of these crimes, um, they were... How can I say they were if, if if the family or the perpetrator belonged to a family was a little bit more upscale that they were very uh, intent on keeping it out of the press and stuff like that because they knew it would fall back on the family name. Yeah, I think that's all true. It was probably more easy to do then too to keep things out. Right. And um, let me ask you, and I, and I remember this uh, because, uh, you know, I know that there's a series of books that have been written about H.H. H. Holmes and stuff like that. And you know how everybody now talks about all these dating apps and dating things. And I'm thinking, you know, everybody thinks that this is a modern. I say back then they had like personals that people would post in the newspaper along similar lines. And you would have yes. women, and especially women, the travel across the country. But uh, there are newspapers devoted to personal ads. Right. They were called Lonely Hearts columns. Yes. Yes. And, uh, very often criminals would find victims that way. Yes. And I... I you know, and of course, there usually there was involved a promise of marriage. And it's incredible how I think H.H. H. Holmes, he got a couple of women or more than one along the lines of, uh, you know, advertising, you know, they set up correspondence. And here you go off to meet and get married, except nobody ever hears from that person again. Um, right. it, yeah, uh, he did it. Bell Gunnis did it. Uh, Harry Powers did it. Those are just a few off the top of my head. But yes. Yeah, they, they would uh, advertise for victims. Right, right. Exactly. Or they were real big bigamists. So they would actually online go through dating this. and the dangers of dating that way. That's right. They, um, God, what was the other? Well, there was one that I read about not too long. I think, I want to say his last name was Brower or Browen, something like that out of Chicago around the turn of the century. And I want to say that he m married loosely based because sometimes, you know, they don't have an exact uh, over 50 women. And a lot of them, he killed them. Uh, of course, he was doing the uh, that insurance, life insurance scam thing or taking their money. And it's incredible. Eventually they caught him and I think he got, yeah, he was hung for the thing, but and they even say, even now, they think he had an excess of 50 victims, familiar. but even now. Yeah, he was, um, I believe he was a German immigrant, and he had come, and he had, like, this first legitimate wife. And then he just went on this wave of marrying women. And usually, even if they weren't really rich, but that they had some type of property, they were widows, so they had something, in other words. And in some cases, he would take all their money, and, and in some, some he didn't, and others, he actually would uh, find ways of doing away with them through that weird accident kind of setup. And um, I can't think of his name. I know who you mean, though. It's B R A U E R or something along those lines, something like that. And um, he. Uh, I just can't, but I know who you mean. Right. And um, they and, and, and again, you go into this scenario where these women are marrying this man that they've really barely knew, know. <laughs> and and of course, um, before you know it, 
Uh, he's either stripped them of all their rich, whatever money they had or property. And if they, they were lucky if they got out alive because, uh, and uh, you can tell that there's a, they, they're a psychopath because they can't figure out how eventually they get caught <laughs> because yeah, they're leaving a trail of dead women. You know, I, I, wish I wish I could remember his name. You know what? Hold on. Uh, but I think he lived in Illinois in Chicago. Hold on. There have really been a lot of guys like that through history. Um, right. And that's what I'm saying. Some of them, you, you know, they make the papers and that, you know, like, you know, and, and for that time period, they're, they're, everybody's, um, you know, um, let me see, bro. Usually they get called Bluebeard after the French, um, folktale figure Bluebeard. Right. Or I have Chicago Bluebeard or New York's Bluebeard. Um, as a matter of fact, um, I, I know that there was, um, there was another one. Uh, this was the other way, something like what you're talking about, but it was the woman and she, I believe her name was Tilly Klimek. And I want to say they called her like the female Bluebeard because she kind of did that the same kind of like, um, was married. And, but, but like, you know, that typical thing that you see with women where they use poison. Um, oh, right. uh, let me see. Uh, let me see if I can. Bill Gunnis is a good example. Uh, who... She definitely did place ads. Hey, everybody. Um, you're going to notice that there's just a different, um, basically a different version of the video and it's because we were having such a problem with the audio um on and we wanted to make sure that that everything could be mis uh, understood better so i called kevin back on the landline well not a landline i saw what i'm talking about there is no such thing as landlines anymore just kidding all right <laughs> i know there's people that they that they are but but anyway it's it's going to be a phone um conversation with a video and but there's this picture right there so all of you can see what he looks like as we're talking about, uh, well, you know, because he's done so much research uh, about all these historical crimes and pe things people were up to in the good old days. And um, we were commenting right before we, we jumped over to this version that, you know, you had some uh, some criminals which got a lot of notoriety, which are like the, the Lizzie Bordens and the H.H. H. Holmes and, well, Jack the Ripper, let's not even go there. Um, and then there was other crimes that were, you know, that happened, some unsolved, by the way, that, yeah, in the moment that they occurred, they got a lot of publicity. And then it just went away. And you you, you mention it to somebody nowadays and they're like, huh, what, who? And uh, getting back to that, uh, Kevin, uh, you were mentioning about somebody that was a blue beard and I couldn't catch the name of the of that person that you were talking about? Oh, her name was Belle Gunnis. Oh my <laughs> God, yes, my Belle. Friend. Yeah, Harold Schechter just wrote a great book about her. So she's one who did not drop from the headlines. She's kind of a, a ogre-like figure in mythology even to this day. Well, I think also the fact that she was never caught, right? As far as I know, they never... She disappeared. And she, uh, what was it? She was it a servant girl? She put her in there, like to make it believe like that was her body, and it wasn't. Well, they did find a body, but they never ascertained for sure that that was her. And a lot of people thought, well, you know, she's been so clever about all this. She's probably just murdered somebody roughly her size. Yes. And made everyone think it was her, but she was never seen again. So it's still a matter of debate to this day if she got away. Right. And, and and I think that what people find the most difficult is that she killed her own children. Yeah, her own children, and I forget how many men, which is another thing that keeps her famous and notorious, is that she actually, uh, well, she was female, and this is not typically behavior that you see. Right. And we were talking previously how people were very trusting in the sense of that they would do these personal ads 
for marriage of all things and that men yeah. and women would travel across a country to go see a total stranger yeah and she proved that men would would, would be willing to do that too she she was uh would place ads uh seeking scandinavian men mm-hmm. so men of scandinavian descent would would uh read the ads and she would promise them marriage and they would come visit her farm she also promised them a big farm yeah, so that's female amazing. companionship and a farm right and that was the big selling point and she i forget how many men she killed but it was it was quite a few i think it was about a dozen or so right right exactly and um i think also she was banking on um uh, where if there were immigrants, maybe they had little or no family in the country. In other words, nobody to say, hey, so-and-so left for wherever she was at. We never heard from him again. Yeah, and, she was um, really smart about taking her victims. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, the last thing you wanted was for... But I think ultimately, one of her last victims, I think, I believe that was something along those lines where a family member followed up, trying to. I think it was his brother or something like that, trying to find out yeah. what happened to him. Yeah, it was the brother of, um, I'm probably going to mispronounce it, but the victim was Andrew Helgeline. Okay. And his brother came looking for him, and he was able to trace him to Belganis' farm, and not long after that, she disappeared and the house burned down. So she must have known she was about to get caught. Yes. Yes, exactly. And um, I think that, you know, and, and I think we spoke about this the first time we interviewed, which is that uh, women got away with a lot of uh, murders because people didn't believe that they would be capable of that. Yeah, it was sort of a sentimental idea at the time. Right. It's one reason Lizzie Borden. Uh, personally, I think she did it, but it's one reason she got away with it. Was everyone thought, well, there's no way a woman could do this to right. attend Sunday school, and especially wouldn't do this to her own father. Right. But apparently right. she did, and she was able to trade off that sentimental idea that women would never do anything like this. I have a lot of cases in my books of female poisoners. <clears throat> And I right. guess you'd call them serial killers because they would generally rack up quite a score of victims. Usually, right. though, it was for money. You know, they would insure someone in their family, poison them, and collect the money. So their motive appears to be more like financial gain or getting rid of people who are bothersome or cumbersome to them rather than the sheer thrill of it, which is what you get in your typical actual serial killing. Well, the, um, and I believe also another thing was that a lot of households, didn't they keep arsenic on hand, I believe, for rodents? And oh, some of them absolutely. would use that? It was amazing. Uh, they had arsenic and all kinds of things, and strychnine and uh, insecticides, pesticides. Even some patent medicines had traces of arsenic and poison. So it was certainly easy to get it. Uh, you could even go down to the drugstore and buy things like cocaine. Right. Yes. Everybody doesn't realize that. And, and I believe also along those lines, there was especially women that got addicted to laudanum because they would get some of it from a doctor for maybe a headache or to sleep better before you knew it. They were hooked on it. Oh, it's definitely true. Uh, the, the patent medicines of the time were largely alcohol, so it was a legal way of getting alcohol. And a lot of Civil War veterans and a lot of, just, well, just anybody, everybody, were introduced to drugs through patent medicines. Well, let me ask you, have you heard of the story, which I thought was, I heard um, back in the 1990s, they... So, uh, they were uh, a house in Liverpool in England. They were redoing it, remodeling it. It was an, it was an older home. Right, it's a, Maybrick. Case. Maybrick, Maybrick. Yeah, and, and uh, some British authors tried to make out like he was Jack the Ripper. Right. Do you think that he was diary. Jack the Ripper? What do you think? Uh, I really think he wasn't. The diary, I'm awfully sure, was a hoax. It was very well crafted, and the interesting thing about the book isn't really the Jack the Ripper sections, but the parts about Maybrick, because he also 
was evidently murdered, but it's really hard to say. Right. Uh, and the or in England, they all blamed it on his wife. Right, I know. They put her, they they sent her to jail, wife. this poor woman. But um, then, uh, the, the judge who put her away was actually clinically insane. <laughs> That's just And it was proved that Maybrick had a habit of taking poisonous drugs uh, for the thrill of it. Okay. So a lot of people don't know this, but if you take certain drugs, arsenic in small doses, it acts as an aphrodisiac, like Viagra. Really? And apparently, yeah, apparently he was sort of a drug addict. So yeah, they found a lot of arsenic and other poisons in his body, but he probably took it himself. And I imagine up to a certain point, don't you also build up a tolerance for it, as you far do. as that you need to take more and more? Right, and then you have to take more and more. So it's very possible that he finally took a dose that was too big, like so many rock stars do. They take a little and then a little more and then a little more, and then the day mm -hmm. comes and they take the dose they can't handle. It's probably what happened with Maybrick. Right, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, um, and I really don't understand how his wife ended up getting put... I, 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 From what I understand, because she... She came from a well-to-do family here in the United States. And that was part of it. There was evidently a prejudice against her because she was American. Really? And mm -hmm. also they proved that she had been having an affair. So everyone oh, was yeah. how she was an adulteress. And right, then like, on top uh, of those things, the judge was clinically insane. That part doesn't help, I'm telling you. But yeah, I imagine back then... Yeah. If, like, in other words, I hate to say it, but it is what it is. Like, if if you were a woman and you could be cheating on your husband, you could have killed him, of course. Like, that's one thing is very close to the other. I, I mean, in the mores of those days. Right, um, that was uh, the mindset. Yes. And I believe she was in jail something like 10 or 15 years. Yeah, she was there for a while. And, and uh, um, was very lucky to finally get out. And right, she I think, came back to the USA. Right, and she lost her kids, everything. Her children, everything. You know, this poor lady, but I, probably the worst I would have to say would having a judge that's insane pretending to be normal can be just about the worst thing that could happen to anybody that's that's, uh, true. that's going yeah. to trial for murder. <laughs> and um, and back then, you know, uh, un unfortunately, no, it was I imagine it would be very difficult to everybody to bring up the obvious. Hey, that judge needs to be removed because he's insane. It's like. He was probably high up on the food chain of the, um, you know, society, I so. Think, I think that in England at the time, once you were appointed a judge, it was almost impossible. Yeah, see. To be, uh, to be taken out of the position. Right, unless you, you voluntarily stepped down or retired. Wife. Yeah, like a Supreme Court justice here. Uh, you don't, unless yeah. you retire or you die, you're in it for life. Right, it's a, it's a life appointment. It's, you're there. Right. And um, I'm telling you, the when I read that, I was like, wow, wouldn't it be funny if this guy turns out to be, you know, Jack the Ripper? Um, because, you know, you know, you, 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 it, with Jack the Ripper, you go from the gamut of he was uh, either a gentleman or a doctor or somebody well-educated to the, he was somebody off the streets and they can't make up their mind and... I mean, oh, there's yeah, probably forty or fifty suspects. Yes. I don't think we'll ever really know who it was. Yep, 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 yep. I think if there were any proof of any sort, we would have had it by now. Exactly. I'm not sure his name actually may be in the record somewhere, but just not as Jack the Ripper. Right. You know, well, somebody like that doesn't just come out of nowhere, and very likely, I've theorized that he probably committed a series of small crimes against women before moving into his really horrible Jack the Ripper crimes. And I've always thought that if you went through the records and you really had the patience for it and you kept seeing a name coming up over and over, mm -hmm. someone with increasingly violent crimes against women, right? that might be the person. Right. And people don't realize that back then and now that a lot of murderers, that's how they start out. Exactly like what you just described. They start out with small... Uh, right. Transgression they, against women. They start off, you know, with a horrific 10 on a scale of 10 horrible crime right off the bat. They work their way up. 
And even the ripper cranes, if you look at them closely, each one was worse than the last one. So even those crimes got worse with time. Right, because it was... Do, do you do you think... Because, I mean, there's so many versions. Do you really think that he was a doctor or somebody that was uh, knowledgeable about anatomy? Or was uh, it just the press trying to get readers? I really have doubts about it. Um, I don't think it was a doctor. I think everyone at the time wanted it to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. It makes a better story, for one thing, if Jack the Rapper is a, is a practicing doctor. But I, I think doctors were prominent enough that if he really had been one, he would have been caught because somebody would have noticed. Right, exactly. Uh, he didn't have some anatomical knowledge. But there's a case in America that's kind of like that. It's the uh, Cleveland headhunter, a.k.a. the torso murderer. Uh, he was a, a killer in Cleveland, Ohio, during the Depression. And okay. he killed a number, quite a number, far more than Jack the Ripper. And he was never caught either. And he was an expert at disembodying, uh, taking arms and legs and heads off. Everyone who examined it said, wow, he does this with surgical skill. So like with Jake the Ripper, everyone was saying, well, he had to be a doctor. And the number one suspect actually is a doctor who uh, went to a mental institution and died in 1964. But in one of my books, my argument is that rather than being a pro medical professional, probably this was just a guy who who took apart so many human bodies and got so good at it through practice that it looked like he had medical skill. Right, right. In other words, In other yeah, words, because we give him too much doctor. credit. Um, yeah. Right. I don't think he was a doctor. I don't think he was a medical student. I don't think he was anything of the sort. I just think he had decapitated a lot of people before he finally turned up in Cleveland. And by that point, he was so good at it, it looked like he had medical skill. And I think that's probably true of Jack the Ripper, too. Let me ask you, because I think um, that torso, didn't, what, what, weren't there some murders that were committed, like, along the railroad lines, or? Yeah, that's exactly it. Right. Uh, not all of them, but some of them took place very close to railroad tracks which uh, has led a lot of people to think that the Cleveland torso murderer might have been someone involved with trains, like a train man, a conductor, a brake man, something like that, uh, even a railroad detective. Right, right, because... Or a um, hobo, someone who traveled by train. Right, because there was, it's almost that, um, and at the same time, from what I understand, that there was also a lot of... Um, what is it? I don't want to say like homeless encampments. In other words, that there were soft targets in that area also. Oh, exactly. Most of his victims were uh, transients, hobos. He murdered at least 12, possibly 13, perhaps more than that. And I found some murder victims that happened before from the 1920s okay. that sound exactly like his work which is one reason I think he didn't just show up in Cleveland doing this stuff. I think he'd been doing this for a long time before he came to Cleveland. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a very fascinating case. His first couple victims were identified. They were Cleveland residents, or the first couple victims that we certainly know he did. Right, right. But then after that, his victims started becoming transients and uh, tramps and hobos, and I think what was going on was that he was smart enough to say, hey, if I keep killing people who are actually living here in the city, eventually I'm going to be caught because they're going to associate me with the victim. So I'm going to start picking completely random people who aren't from here, who just happen to be passing through, and that's going to make it harder to make a connection. Right. But just like everything, you know, these people, sometimes they don't have a family of origin or anybody to you know, hound the police, hey, what have you done about this, or, you know. Oh, if, exactly, right. Uh, but they, he was never caught. And, it, it, and it's really funny because I say, you know, some of these um, murderers, they, they get caught because they have a big mouth. They talk too much. <laughs> and then there's others that are real smart, and they never say anything to anybody. 
even if they end up in jail, you know, some of these guys, they'll, once they're behind bars, they'll say, you know, that murder back in so-and-so, I, I was me. And then there's others, I think, that they learn, you never talk about they, it. They drop, yes. You'll notice the ones who really get away with it, like Jank the Ripper or, or um, the Cleveland Torso murderer, tend to be lone wolf types. Yes. Yes. Yes, with, exactly. I mean, we can't say they were friendless. We know nothing about them. But obviously they didn't have too many acquaintances or somebody might have put two and two together. Exactly. Exactly. Like, hey. Uh, and it's, I don't know if you've noticed lately, they've, they're, um, you know, that they have that DNA database that they've been feeding all this DNA into. Yeah. And they've been solving cold cases like crazy. Yeah. Like really, really cold, what I call really cold cases. Really cold cases from the yeah. 60s and 70s. Yes. Uh, yes. Some that seemed like they would never be ever solved, mm -hmm. ever have been yes. solved. And that's one of the good things about Ancestry.com and 23andMe. Yes. Because they, um, and they've even helped, uh, the other day I was reading where they had, um, God, was it Utah, some Ooh. national park, they had uh, found the 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 remains the skeletal remains of a young well no later on they realize it's, it's like man. oh any minute now my real identity will be gone hopefully yeah. i won't go out again if it does i'll call you right back yeah, right, don't worry about it but what the, were we talking about now, no, we were talking about the dna how dna now is being oh, used and you were talking about um right. even uh, familial dna is being uh, used Right. I mean, if you committed a murder back in the 70s and, and you're really paranoid about your DNA being discovered, you don't have to go on Ancestry.com, but you can't keep your brothers, your cousins, your oh, third no. cousin from getting on there. And they've been checking the DNA and they've really, really been catching them. Well, That's why yeah. I think someday people like Zodiac will indeed be identified. Well, they the other day I read about one. This guy killed a girl in 1980 in Colorado she he, he abducted her she had she was a young intern you know she was a college student and she would take the bus and then walk to her the house where she was staying at her uh, aunt and uncles he abducted her raped her killed her and they there was you know yeah they had DNA but back then there was no, no testing and they had a few suspects the years roll along and they did the DNA uh, finally, you know, because, you know, they just pump all this information in there. Finally, they got a hit through a family back in 2017. All right. And originally they said they had come across 3000 uh, relatives because it happened that apparently he had a very convoluted family history. And his mom had used six names, but originally they had to whittle it down from 3,000 relatives till finally they found the guy and he was living down here, not too far from where I live in Northern Florida in an area called Lake Butler. And um, he was a truck driver and uh, they were interviewing somebody that knew. He goes, oh, he goes, I never, he never looked like a, uh, he never looked like a, uh, like a violent guy. And unfortunately, back like in 76, before he killed this girl, he had gone to jail because he took a woman at knife point and raped her in Arkansas. And he had gone this, to, and they had paroled him. Instead of going, the, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. No, instead of, instead of, uh, I, I believe they sentenced him to 30 years and then they put it to 10 bottom line they paroled him after four years and when he was out on parole was when he killed this girl and then you know he disappeared fast forward almost 40 years and they did the dna and he's in his 60s and well he pled yeah. guilty so he was given um you know uh, the, the, the statute of limitations they suspect him in other rape cases in that area in Colorado around that time but since the statute of limitations was expired on any of that all he was he pled guilty to the second degree murder and he got like 25 years with a chance of parole but he's like 60 something okay 
but uh, it it was the uh, like exactly like what you described the the family some family member did the uh, submission to one of those you know find out what your pie chart looks like <laughs> yeah and that's how they found them that's how they found I was, them I was thinking that was the so called I ninety five killer but mm-hmm. actually I believe that's a different case because they did yeah. find him. Yeah. Only a few, a couple of weeks ago, but he was dead. He died like uh, four or five, six years ago. Right. I know. I've. I remember. I know that there was the yeah. I sixty five and, or I. I know that there's some of them that. Um, that yeah, they're tied into like the no. You know which one you're talking. If it's the one that I think <laughs> about know. that that I sixty five that, he went in and he killed. Uh, he would do. He would. I think he went into some. Uh, motel lobbies or you know those strip shopping centers but they would re- be right off the highway yeah yeah and, and he was a trucker too i think but no uh, that just, uh, you know what he used to do finding these guys. no you know why he got around so much he worked why for that? the railroad for 30 years and the railroad oh. he would like travel around the area for the railroad not on the railroad per se but do we work for the railroad company? He worked for them for 30 years. Which uh, sort of goes back to one of the theories about the Cleveland headhunter, that he yes. might have been a train man, which of would course. explain why he could commit murder and then he'd be gone because he'd be out of town right. for days or weeks. Yes. And they, the newspaper interviewed his third wife, which is he was married to her for 20 years. They married like when they were in their 40s, a little bit older than her. And he died, I think it was 2013. And it's, you should see the, you know how they, when they write the obit, the obituaries, and that he was so kind and so this, and the guy would go and sell vegetables at a farmer's market. And this last wife he had, he goes, I had no idea. I guess I'm lucky to be alive. And it's like, okay. All right. <laughs> there you go. I mean, that's generally how they seem to be. Yes. If they were all evil and violent and scary, nobody would come anywhere near them. Right. Or somewhere along the line, they realize, you know what? I don't want to be old and die in jail, so I better stop killing people. Yeah, there's and, definitely a lesson in this, which is it's getting harder and harder to get away with this. Yes, yes. And, and, and it makes you wonder if this man went out... He was killing women he didn't know. There was no... You know, the, the motivator sometimes for crimes like, you know, love, revenge, obsession, you know, you left me. Yeah, n- none of that. These were women who he didn't know that he was killing them and some of them he raped them. And I'm thinking, how could you go on these rampages and then mend your ways and stop because you knew you were going to get caught? In other words, even if you had this, I don't know, I don't know what to call it, some desire that you could stop yourself. Right. That, that shows that uh, at least some of them. They can stop if they really try. Sure. Yeah, when they know that they don't want to be old and in jail. You know? And uh, when when they're describing that he would grow all these vegetables, they lived in this little town with like maybe 300 residents, and he would grow all these vegetables and then go to like the nearest town center where they have the family of farmers. Blame everything on older guys. Let me tell you something. There is, there's uh, some unknown paranormal experience going on here some uh, unknown uh deceased serial killer is like hey you know either he's upset because we're talking about him or we're not because you know some of, a lot of these guys were narcissists <laughs> it's like why why didn't i make the papers why why aren't i famous after the fact that's a good theory is that a yeah, they, you know, so a lot of these guys, you know, that they, after, once they get caught, then they, 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 they want to make the papers and they want to get interviewed and then, you know. Yeah, nice they want like to that. avoid being caught and they want to avoid being punished, but once they are caught. Yes. Then they want to be famous and celebrities. Right. Well, I think there's a big myth that everybody thinks that some of these psychopathic serial killers are all like geniuses. <laughs> And I beg to differ. I, some of them are. Some of them are. But there's some a lot are, that are not. not yeah, uh, just based on what I can see about them, by and large, they, they're just pretty lucky. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. And they know how to they know how to manipulate circumstances in their favor, but that doesn't make them geniuses. Yeah, exactly. Most of the time they get trapped up and caught by some incredibly foolish mistake. Right, and I think also in the past when they would have these scenarios, you know, where the different jurisdictions where they would, even if it wasn't another state, but they would just do a crime in another jurisdiction and some of these police departments wouldn't talk to each other. So they didn't realize that they were basically looking for the same person. Yeah, there was speculation that Zodiac did that, that he would intentionally commit murders in different jurisdictions, knowing that police would be jealous of their information and not want to share it with each other, making them harder to catch. Right, because... Which is pretty crafty. It doesn't make him a genius, but that's pretty crafty. Yeah, yeah, and, and, uh, and of course, back then, you know, Especially if who if, if it was a sheriff that was getting voted in, he, he wanted to be the person to break the case of, of, of a murder, you know, and not let somebody else take the glory. So, yeah, that would be yeah. interesting if that Zodiac killer, they, they've had a couple of, do you think that there's, and you know how there's always theories about there was this person or it was that person. Do you think there was any suspect that was pretty accurate that it could have been the Zodiac? I'm just guessing. I haven't really heard any suspects at all that I think are very likely. There's some that you can point to this circumstance and that circumstance, but then there are a lot of others that don't match, and always they want to emphasize the ones that do seem to match. But I think he'll be caught one day because there actually is a partial DNA, uh, DNA grade, what's the word, profile? Is that it? Right, yeah. Yeah, well, once they have the, uh, they the sequence, have they, they trace it back. Uh, right. Someday his fourth cousin will go on 23 and me. My guess is it's that he's dead, but oh, at least yeah. he'll be identified. Can you imagine you do, <laughs> can you imagine you do your, your pie chart and you find out you're related to this serial killer? It's like, oh. Oh, it, it certainly can My happen. third cousin removed his so-and-so. Right. I mean, they have to be related to somebody. Yeah. And well, what, what I was Amazing saying is... Of it, but his yeah. crimes took place almost 60 years ago from, mm-hmm. you know, the late 60s, and we're bearing down on that. Yes. Yes. And, um, and I think also, because from what I understand, some of these... Uh, older cases, you know, any evidence that they could have tried to extract DNA from, they've, they got rid of it. You know, there's no, there's nothing left for them to even try to get a DNA, uh, either a a blood stain, you know, they, they, they would get rid of these, uh, evidence boxes as time moved forward. Yeah, that is true. But starting in the fifties and sixties, they, I think they were, they started trying to collect more type of evidence, and hopefully... There were a lot of efforts, yeah. And with Zodiac, you know, he, he wrote letters, so we've got lots of envelopes and stamps that he licked. Yes, yes. And some of them, that's what I'm talking about, that some of them, they're... In other words, they want to be recognized for their handiwork or for their intelligence and being able to outsmart. Well, look at what happened to BTK that he was so smart that he didn't realize that when he sent in, well, back then what was a floppy disk, that it was carrying the imprint from the computer. Yeah, that's a good, it's also a good example of how they can stop if they want to. Oh, sure. Because he didn't kill anybody after, I think, 1990 or 1991, he he just stopped. Yes, yes. And And then he got all smart and thought he'd scare everybody and started sending out the letters again and then he got caught. And And they had DNA on him too. I mean, once they had a suspect, it was a simple matter to test his DNA. Right. And, um, and it's really funny because the, um, he was, what was it? A code enforcement officer. And he had, he had a reputation for being, being a real pain in the, you know, where, like, uh, he, you know, he used right. to, um, and it's like that, that sounds so typical, you know, where they... True, I mean, it, a lot of people thought that that actually might have been one reason he quit killing. He had the urge, like all the serial killers do, to dominate 
and manipulate and control people, and that gave them a legal way to do it. The handful of people, if their lawns weren't short enough or if they had this decoration out that wasn't allowed in the neighborhood. So he could push people around, but in a legal way. Right, right. Like, uh, and I heard that his neighbors, he, 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 from what I understand, he was terrorizing, and I want to use that word, his neighborhood. Like he, it yeah, uh, he was a compliance officer, but apparently he was a far, far more gung ho about it than you would expect, taking it way too seriously. Right, exactly, and um, it's really funny but because now that we know who he really was, it really fits right in. Uh, it was so funny because a couple of days ago, my son, he's. Uh, He's uh, uh, working on this big construction job out in, down in, in uh, Broward County in Fort Lauderdale. And they're, they're taking, you know, these older houses on the water and they're redoing and they're making these beautiful multi-million dollar mansions and all this. And he's telling me about a, a compliance officer and he goes, he's like, mom, this guy shows up and he thinks he's a cop. And he's like, he, he the way he was telling me about it, I was like, oh my God, this reminds me, you know, of somebody that uses this job like um it's like one thing is if you're doing your job you got to do right. your job i understand that but it was like whoa this has a flavor of a and i told my son you know, be careful with that guy because oh he, yeah being they get carried well away. you know a lot of serial killers are rather fascinated with military life or with police work and a lot yes. of them actually wanted to be policemen yes Yes. And got rejected for one reason or another. And being a compliance officer in the neighborhood is just another way It'll of being an authority figure. And what's really funny is that um, the some of these, in, in which, well, you know what the thing is that most of these, um, like compliance officers or whatever, they, they, there's no psych back, there's no psych testing for that for a cop or. Something like that, you, you're going to get some type of psychological testing done. But, you know, if you apply to do uh, what they call code enforcement or something like that, they, they don't, as long as you, you know, you pass the background, you're going to be okay. So that's how you get a lot of these sometimes unsuitable people in those types of jobs. Uh, but, uh, and also the that Golden Gate killer, he's another one that got nabbed a few years ago on the DNA from a family member. And he really was a cop. Yeah, he was a cop for a bit. It was really scary to think about. Yes, right, exactly. And um, when when you see things like that, he was another one that uh, later on he pe he stopped. Well, at one point they thought it was more than one guy, and it turned out he was doing everything. He was murdering, he was raping, he was robbing, he did everything, and they were thought they didn't realize that they were looking for the same suspect. But. Um, He's another one that, as he got older, he stopped doing all that stuff. Yeah, it's a sort of a myth when they say, well, once they start killing, they can never stop till they're caught. But no. that's yeah, true. They, some, they, of that... them, some of them do stop, and they can stop. Right, exactly, exactly. And um, I'm going to ask you about a real, what you think about this? And I know this is a very... This is one of those cases that's very known, which is the Black Dahlia. You know that... Uh, oh right. The Dr. Hodel's son wrote that that book. I think it's very written like two of them basically outlining why he thinks that the Black Dahlia's killer was his dad. Um what do you think about that? Do you think he's on the money with that? I'm trying to remember what his reasons were. I I remember reading it but not being terribly impressed with it. I've never read it. I mean, I know of, of it, but I haven't read it. And basically, I just can't remember his reasons, but they didn't strike me as really good ones. He almost like um, to, to, I think one his... thing was the father had a picture of a young woman taken in the forties who kind of, sort of looked like Elizabeth Short, but maybe it wasn't her. That look was very popular at the time. That hairstyle, like, could have been anybody. Well, um. One of the things that, number one, well, besides him being a doctor, uh, and um, that supposedly 
he hung out. One of the things that they pointed out was that he ran in the crowd. And at that time, that artist man, Ray, was out there in California. And there's right. a painting that he did, which is, if you look at it, it's very similar to the way the Black Dahlia's body was displayed. You know, when they when she was found out there in that park or right. wherever it was. Right. That if you look at the comparison, and apparently Man Ray was a friend of his, and I know that that's one of the things. It was a, a bunch of other things that were looked at um, that he cited as to why he believes it was his dad. I'll have to read it. Um, because that's another one, one of those murders that, um, I mean, I know this, she was kind of doing a risky lifestyle and stuff like that, but, um, it makes you wonder, you know, could this, was this this man or was it again, that stranger on stranger crime, which sometimes are the most difficult to solve because there's no connection between the perpetrator and the victim. It's possible he did it, but it just didn't strike me as tremendously good evidence. So the guy, the doctor, Dr. Hodel, mm -hmm. he didn't seem like a nice person for sure. Right. And um, a woman I determined all these things, but that describes a lot of people. Right. And, 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 you know, sometimes you hear that in some of these defenses where, you know, you could be a real jerk. To make, but that doesn't make you a murderer or you could be a liar but that doesn't make you a murderer right. you know you see some defense people say you know this person could be a horrible person but that doesn't make him or her a murderer you know well i remember there was a woman about i don't know 20 25 years ago wrote a book in which she said her father was the black dahlia killer and her evidence was pretty much only um it was repressed memory from childhood that i had so i saw him cutting up her body and did just, that just strikes me as being not very convincing. Again, yeah. It's like... Just, yeah. Uh, I, I... I need more than that. Right, exactly. Like, I witnessed this as a child and, you know, wh wh why would but your you father do this when you were around? Anything. Right, you can convince yourself of anything. And it's what she says about her father is true. He was a horrible person. Right. But again, that doesn't make him the killer. Exactly. Exactly. And that's one of the things that you find nowadays, especially with, a, well, I think there's always been publicity for a lot of these trials, you know, that people turn out for them. And um, because, you know, even back then it was like, there's nothing better to do, no television. So everybody would turn out for some of these trials. Oh, right. Yeah, you'll see that repeatedly in my books is trials were just booked solid. Mm -hmm. Not really booked in the sense that people were buying tickets or anything, but people would turn up by the thousands, and they'd right, actually get buy it, get a seat in the courthouse. And once they got in, they wouldn't leave. They'd bring right. lunches with them. Exactly. And I want to say also, and I hate to say it, but back then also the court of public opinion was very powerful. And um, I want to say in some instances it even affected uh, the judges and people like that. Um, well, I'm sure it did, and uh, the newspapers, they had libel laws back then, too, but they definitely didn't seem to be quite as strict about following them. So I'm always astounded when I'm doing the research, and I'll read what the newspapers are saying about, about uh, suspects before they even go to trial, and they're just saying all these things about them, and you'll think, how could they possibly have gotten a fair trial? Right. With all this very, very negative pre-trial publicity. Yes, yes. You know, now, even what... the edit editors flatly saying that they're guilty before they've even gone to trial. Right, they would stir up this whole thing to build up, of course, readership. But talk about character assassination. You would get a lot I of that. I think some of them got sued for libel later, but, but they kept doing it. Well, the, and what's, what, what you see also, um, and I hate to say it was the, uh, again, the same, the, with the women, I'm going to go either, either a woman couldn't have done it, or if there was some type of proof that like, that sunk the boat, like with this Maybrick thing, where if she was, if she could be unfaithful to her husband, of course she could have killed him. Right. You know, it worked, that was the other, the other way that it worked against women, even though I do agree with you that. Probably a lot of them got away with the uh, the poisoning and 
Uh, well, it's sort of a running joke in my books is how easily women got away with murder back then. Yeah. Even when they were caught, even when it was proved, men, they were all male juries, and they were extremely reluctant to put women yes. um, on death row, so they would find every excuse they could. But uh, just like you were saying, most of the time the idea was, well, women couldn't do anything like that. But then if they did find one, they did suspect one, and there was proof, then they just went all out with the libelous yes. accusations. And uh, Right, right. It kind, of, it, it kind of like went in the other direction. But even in yeah, the sense the of way. if she was found to be um, morally deficient, how's that? In right, other words, exactly. Once they thought you did something, then they'd really, really go after you in the press. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly, and that's what that, that's what I'm saying. That sometimes the woman thing, if it was, it worked in your favor as long as you had the the the, the mantle of, I could never have done that. But if it came out that you were up to no good and they could prove it, it was like off of oh, their yeah, head. It was vicious. <laughs> how they would go after people, but especially women. And then it was, oh, they're just uh, so totally unlike the, the way womanhood should be. Yes, right, exactly, exactly. Like, uh, you know, how could she, you know, she's like, you know, worse than the devil, that kind of thing. And uh, that's why I'm saying that Lizzie Borden, it's not surprising in a way, like you, you said that after it concluded and she was basically absolved, their, whether they believe she had killed her, her her father or just the, you know, guilt by association. Nobody wanted to associate with her because of the stigma of having been accused of murdering. Or, or what is it, patricide? It's a very interesting case in that regard. About half the press thought she was thought she was guilty and nothing short of the devil. And then the other half of the press thought she was had to be totally innocent. No way she could have done it. She taught Sunday school. It's impossible. Right. Exactly. And then she was acquitted and then everyone dropped her. Yes. Yes. It was almost it... like they were all pretending to believe she was innocent. Then when she was found innocent, they they didn't want to deal with the fact with the idea that possibly she wasn't. Well, and you know, I hate to say it, but let's face it, the way that her stepmom and her father were killed, I imagine there's got to be some of them going, what if, what if, she, what if she really did, what if she really did do it? Do I really want to be around Lizzie? Yeah, I'll pass on that. You know, so it's like that kind of thing. And, and of course, everybody knows that she refused. She had enough money to have left uh, where she was living that town, but she refused to leave. That's true. She just moved to a richer neighborhood, and her sister moved in with her. And then several years later, her sister moved out. It was just Lizzie Borden and her servants. Yes. And you know what? I spoke to some, I can't remember, somebody that had was looked at, and she says that contrary to, they said that um, that Lizzie had a, uh, she wasn't like a ladylike person. She had like a gruff voice and very like, you know, like, it wasn't like she was doing this lady like, oh, you know, I'm so feminine and helpless. You know, she said that she could pull that off. She had a gruff voice and she was kind of like a boorish type of person as a woman. So and even then she she got acquitted. So. Yeah. She would have been interesting to talk to. I wish I could have met her. At least I wish <laughs> I knew someone who could who could have told me about her, what she was really like. Uh, that's After a, a certain point, she became so private, nobody really saw much of her again. Right, right. And see, that's the thing. The um, I'm sure you've heard of the Winchester house, the one out in California that right. Sarah Winchester yeah. went out there and built that house that she had some had them working on the thing for like until she died. And I've um, got to see that. I, I I've been out. I've personally been out to see it. And um, what I realized afterwards is they make it look like, you know, she was she married the heir to the Winchester fortune and uh, he died. And then, well, first she lost a, a young child and then her husband died. And supposedly this she was into spiritualism. And between the grief, she went out to California, 
and the spirits told her that she was channeling them that to make up for all the deaths that the Winchester rifle had taken, she had to keep building. One of those deals. But I, later on, I find out, um, first of all, her husband and her child died like 15 years apart. It may, they always make it sound like one thing happened like right after the other. And when she went out there, a lot of her family, because her own family was pretty well to do, um, she had a very active social life. They make it sound like she was a hermit that lived inside this home and that she had people, right, yeah. people constantly working and all she would do was lock herself up in a, in a certain room that she had for uh, doing her, her spiritualism stuff. Turns out this lady was very active socially out in California. You know, that she was doing weird stuff building the house? Absolutely. But from what I understand, um, even the grounds, they, it was like a working farm. She was making money from it. Um, Interesting. You never hear any of that. Yes. The other way it makes a better story. Of course. They make it look like this. she's driven by, uh, driven by grief and cursed by the Winchester or whatever. She goes off to California and locks herself in this mansion and just de tells her workers to build. And they stop the day she dies. And the rest of the time she spent it. And that wasn't, that's far from accurate. And plus she was, she, um, people are not aware. She, her family, her family of origin, they were, they were Freemasons. And that's why you find a lot of uh, Mason, Freemason um, symbology in the design of uh, of a lot of the things in the house, a lot. Oh, I didn't know that either. Yeah, but generally, she if there's two versions of a story, people go with the better story. Yes, yes. Whether it's true or not, I could fill a whole book with examples like that. Well, you know, maybe and, I will. I'll call it. It's a better story that way. Well, you know, it's makes it well. Point the 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 the, the reason I brought it up was that here we're talking about Lizzie Borden. But Lizzie Borden really did, you know, lock herself up in this house, refused to like. In other words, nobody wanted anything to do with her. Her family, even the the her own. Um, it took is... a few years. Evidently, at first, she would occasionally take trips out to Boston to go to the, to the theater, and she had uh, members of theatrical troops stopping by her house for visits. But after a few years, she even quit doing that. Right. But I guess, to me, I'm thinking, I, I imagine, wouldn't her life have been happier if she would have moved away, built this nice house somewhere else? Boston, you know, because it's right. almost like she wanted to, you know, uh, for her family community. or the, the society there that rejected her was like, I'm not going to go away. It's like, yeah, there's some interesting psychology there. Yeah, yeah. And of course, uh, I'm sure you've heard that she had... I. I'm not sure if this was a grandparent or a family member who 20 years or something before had uh, killed her children and committed suicide. I think it was in the property right next to it, um, which makes you wonder, yeah. it, was there some type of family history or something going on? Um, and this, hap this was, I'm going to say... I think it was either her, f and 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 uh, in other words, her father's brother, an uncle's wife, something along those lines. One day, the woman killed or slit her children's throat and killed herself, or something. It was really horrible, and this happened like twenty or twenty-five years before she, you know, this whole thing came about. And uh, but you hardly ever hear about that, you know. It's, um, as far as you know was there something, you know, dark going on in that family that was causing these women to lose it? <laughs> okay, I'm going to throw it on the guys now. <laughs> you know, which is pretty horrible because it's not losing it. That that something like of, the, of that nature, it is serious, but uh, makes you wonder. And, um, but you, you um, as far as, can you, can you give out any information about the books that you're working on right now? Any of them? Well, I'm working on actually three. One is a Civil War book, Strange Stories from a Civil War. Okay. Bizarre little things that are typically unknown. 
And I think that even Civil War busts will find some things in it they didn't know. Okay. And another is a, the last one I did, uh, one of the last ones I did was called Murderous Acts. A hundred years of uh, murder from the Midwest, and it was for Indiana University Press. I'm working on a similar book only covering southern states instead of midwestern states. Okay. And the third thing I'm working on, uh, one book I wrote, oh gosh, I guess about 15 years ago, was called Kentucky Book of the Dead, Okay. which is probably my best seller to date, and I finally got enough material that I'm starting a sequel to it. Okay, and what, what is that about? That Kentucky Book of the Dead. Uh, Kentucky Book of the Dead is all Kentucky stories about ghosts, about strange deaths, about weird epitaphs. Okay. About you know, just all sorts of dark little things like that, embalming methods from the period. Right, because people back then took uh, burials and funerals and cemetery things pretty seriously. <laughs> Yes, they did. They were kind of obsessed with it, but you really get some creepy and true stories. Sometimes right. even some funny ones. Right. I, I, um, I think that uh, even if you, that's I think where you know they, uh, if you were even uh, uh, reprehensible or died in sin or something, they wouldn't. Some cemeteries wouldn't even allow you to get buried there. You had to either go to another cemetery, or get married, buried in the corner. It was like. Oh, uh, yeah. It's absolutely true. I have some stories about that, about people being buried way off to the corner or just beyond the fence line. Yes, yes. It was um, because it was that kind of thing, like it carried, even after death, if you got a bad reputation or you were immoral or, God forbid, uh, anything yeah. like that, it was like, no, you're not going to get buried with the good Christians. We're going to put you over there. Over there behind the we weeds in the corner, and you're lucky if you get a, 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 a monument of any type. Chances are you would yeah. get... Yeah, people don't like realize. Like we were saying earlier, once you got that reputation, it followed you. Yes, it did. It did. It, people don't realize it, I think, because people are so transient nowadays. But back then, where people and families would stay in an area for years and years and years, sometimes generations... These stories, I think, clung sometimes and, and, and got, and in some cases, I imagine, got distorted, you know, in the retelling as to, you know, um, and it, it would cling to it. And uh, when people, uh, even the, you know, that, 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 uh, the bad blood, you know, his great great grandfather did this horrible thing. And look, of course, he's doing it now or stuff like that. People remember those things. Yes, they did. Yeah, that's very true. Well, Kevin, it has been absolutely wonderful to talk to you. Do you have any idea you. when you're going to be releasing the books or you don't have any dates in mind yet? I don't have any dates in mind. Uh, typically, I have a book a year out, but this mm -hmm. year, unfortunately, it looks like I won't have any because I haven't submitted one. And by the time it got published, it would be next year. My guess is, is I'll probably have at least two out next year. But if people are interested in following these things, they can go to uh, my website, which is kevinmcqueenstories.com. Great. Just make sure you spell my name, K-E-V-E-N. Right. And but I I'm have gonna... a couple of Facebook pages, too. Okay. And I'm going to put a, a link to the credit to the show, so that kevinmcqueenstories.com, and it's spelled Kevin, K-E-V-E-N. Yes. And um, I want to wish you the best of luck. And I'll keep, you, I, I, I want to see it because your books are fascinating, you know, because yeah, I'm a, I, I'm a true crime aficionado, like, uh, especially some of these things that you never heard of until you read them and you're like, wow, they did that. Wow. That's pretty bad. Oh yeah. Uh, well, I cover true crime, uh, biography. I cover paranormal and just plain old weird things. Yeah. Not really paranormal, but just weird. Just weird. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Call it real life surrealism. Right, and then I know that sometimes, like all news, well, newspapers that they that I know they would embellish some things sometimes, but uh, yeah. What 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 what's that? If it bleeds, it leads. <laughs> what's that? It thing bleeds, that? Bleeds. <laughs> Something like that. Yep. Back then too. All right, Kevin. Thank you so much, and take care. It's been great talking all to right. you. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye bye. All right. Bye. Okay. <laughs> wow, it's been crazy. 
I'm going to have to stitch this show together from... All right. Sorry. Sorry if my audio at the beginning went wonky. He had a bad connection and that's why we went to the phone and... Uh, uh, whatever. But, you know, such is, such is life in video podcast land. Or oh, we were talking. We had the the some unknown uh, serial killer uh, interfering, committing paranormal sabotage against the interview. You know, I don't think it was anybody that got no. You know what I, I what I was saying. You know that I think that there's a lot of serial killers or killers or people that did stuff that they had no. In other words, they understood the power of anonymity. And they were smart enough, not geniuses, but just smart enough in this one thing to keep their mouth shut. All right. They never told anybody. And some of them don't even do what they call, you know, the deathbed confession. Where they fess up, you know, they take it to the grave with them. And if they ever went to jail, they never talk to their cellmate or they never, then they don't tell anybody, wives, nobody, children. Um, and sometimes they live what they call that double life, which is, and they take it to the grave and they have no desire. There's whatever narcissism is there. They, they fulfill it. They, they don't need that. They don't need the, the, the recognition of, look, I got away with this. And then of course you see the other ones that, you know, all these um, killers, some caught, some not like the Zodiac, like Jack the Ripper that send letters and taunt the police and <clears throat> all of this stuff. Some of them get caught. Some of them don't get caught. Um, there's a lot of them that get caught because they blab either to people uh, or even to cellmates. Uh, they get nabbed for some crime that is not as bad and they blab about the real bad stuff and let's face it, if you're in jail and you're thinking, maybe I can trade this information for a reduction in my sentence, whatever. Yeah, a lot of them get um, get caught like that for certain crimes. Um, and there's a lot of them that, uh, as horrible as it sounds, like exactly like what Kevin was describing, that once they get caught, they bask in the... How can I say it? The the recognition. I mean, I've even read of some of these, especially uh, where they would fall over themselves to get interviewed by newspapermen, you know, because especially when newspapers were, even now they do it, but I'm, I'm going by the, when like the written newspaper was basically the, the, the main media. Um, big newspapers would, send out correspondents, a special reporter to interview the killer, you know, especially if, if it was some type of case that had gotten a lot of attention up to that point. And um, a lot of these killers, they wanted to, they, they looked for, and I imagine their attorneys must have been like, oh my God, you know, what are you doing? Like, shut up. And they, they, couldn't, they can't help themselves. They can't help themselves. They want that recognition. So my point being that maybe we got somebody there that never got never got recognized, never got nabbed. And you know what? What was it? God, I can't. There was a it'll come back to me. I can't I there was a series of killings in California. Oh Marlene. This was um I want to say in the 1960s, 1970s, it was around the 1970s because I remember some of the victims or quite a lot of them were hitchhikers. <clears throat> Bottom line, one of the suspects that later on they kind of, but they, they've never been able to prove it. The guy got killed in a car accident. He drove off the road. He was driving in his van and he died. And they found a, you know, first of all, you can't, you can't accuse, how's this? You can't accuse posthumously, uh, or obviously you can't bring to trial somebody that's passed away. You know, you could say, we think it was this person, but we're not sure it was this person. Uh, all this evidence points to that. 
But officially, if they've never gone to trial for that murder, in other words, gone through the process of a trial, you cannot officially say this person was guilty of committing this murder. So there's there's been uh, times where, um, and this is something that happened along those lines where I'm going to tell you right now what it is because I hate when I can't remember this. Uh, let's see. Uh, and uh, the evidence that they found linked to this person, this this uh, this man, was pretty I, pretty strong evidence that he was. Uh, probably guilty of some of the murders, if not all of them, some of them. And um, here it is. Let me see. But it, he took it to the grave. He, in other words, you know, uh, killers or murderers or whatever, they're subject to the same laws of, you know, that things happen to them. All right, just like anybody else, as in having a fatal car accident. And that was, that's that, that's the end of them. You know, let's see. Uh, I can't remember now. Okay, there's, this is it. This was the hitchhiker murders. And the guy that I'm talking about, uh, one of the persons who's been looked at the killer who did have a direct link to one of the victims was Frederick Fred Manali. He was an Army veteran and he worked as a creative writing instructor at Santa Rosa Junior College in San Quentin Prison. He was killed in a head-on collision when his van veered into oncoming traffic on Highway 12 west of Santa Rosa in August 1976. He was 41 years old. And those queer twists of fate that sometimes explains why certain killers disappear from the murder map. If he indeed was the murderer, the way he died possibly provided the clue to his secret life as a sadomasochistic pervert. Sources say that after the accident, the sheriff found drawings in the back of the van of women in sadomasochistic positions, listing them according to their sexual preference. One of them was Kim Wendy Allen, who was found dead in 1972. Two other students were also depicted in these drawings. If you want to read the article, I have it on my Stranger Than Fiction blog uh, titled The Hitchhiker Murders. My point being that sometimes killers don't get caught because they die you know they 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 or sometimes they they go to jail for other things and they're smart enough let's say they get caught with for burglary for something else and they go to jail for 10 years and if they're smart they don't talk to anybody because they're like i need to get out of here and if one thing is to go to jail for for uh burglary versus murder and then once they get out, they, they never look back. They, they like, hey, you know, they stop. You know, that's why sometimes also you see these stretches where this they have this type of murders being committed. And then there's a drop off. And there's no more murders. And sometimes the police think, oh, this person either went to jail or was killed. Especially if they, they run in certain crowds. You know, somebody does away with them. That happens too. You know. You always find one one person that's just a little bit crazier than you are. And there, that's the end of that. So anyway, guys, I hope you liked this interview with Kevin. I apologize that some of the audio at the beginning was crazy. and um, But thanks again for coming back every week. I've got a lot of great guests coming on. Don't forget to subscribe, like the shows wherever you find them, whether it's YouTube, I'm on BitChute, I'm on Rumble, I'm on Steemit, I'm on um, Cloud Hub. Um, on all the major podcast platforms. Um, and of course, you can always go to MiamiGhostChronicles.com. You can find links to everything there. And also you can find links to the podcast versions without commercial interruptions. All right. You can listen to it on the browser. You can download the MP3 file. I've got links to the videos. And also subscribe to Eerie.News, which is if you want these. Uh, I usually do um, about every other day or every second day. Just weird news that's going on. And uh, I also write articles about some unusual things. So if that's your bag, baby, check it out. Till next time, see you then. Take care and remember, you're all wonderful.